All right, good evening, everyone. I'm pleased you could make it. Um, former UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher once said, you and I come by road or rail, economists travel on infrastructure. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here today and, um, and to welcome uh, Pierre Richard Agenor. Uh, infrastructure, as we all know, whether it's energy or water, transport, telecommunications, uh, you know, touches our lives every day. And uh, well-designed infrastructure facilitates economies of scale, returns to trade, uh, reduces costs of trade, and is therefore central to the specialization of uh, modern economies and the efficient production. Uh, no doubt, it is a vital ingredient to economic growth and development, development for developing countries, poor countries, but also for richer countries. Um, and it is absolutely key to raising living standards. Unfortunately, many issues surrounding the economics of infrastructure are still not very well understood. Enter Pierre Richard Agenor, who for many years now has been at the forefront of putting some clarity into the analysis. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, Pierre Richard. Um, you will today provide an overview of your new book called Public Capital Growth and Welfare, which I've just learned has been endorsed by luminaries such as Jeff Sachs, Kostas Azariadis, and Stephen Chernofsky. Uh, I think that says it all. Uh, the book addresses a series of issues pertaining to the impact of uh, infrastructure on growth, education, health, innovation, um, and its implications in particular for poverty traps, gender bias, and public debt dynamics, all highly relevant um, and important topics. Professor Agenor is the Halsworth Professor of International Macroeconomics and Development Economics and co-director of the Center for Growth and Business Cycle Research at the University of Manchester. Uh, in a previous life, he was lead economist and director of the Macroeconomics and Policy Assessment Skills Program at the World Bank and also at the International Monetary Fund. He also recently joined as a research associate at the Center for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis here at ANU. So we hope to uh, forge and maintain closer ties in the future. He has visited and taught in countless academic departments, has given lectures, seminars, and short courses in universities and research centers in more than 40 countries. However, this is the first time in Australia, so you can add one more country to your list, and we hope it won't be the last time that you will grace us with your presence. Uh, apart from the sheer number and volume of, uh, of his articles and books and monographs, uh, what I find is truly amazing is uh, the, the number of, of sub-disciplines of macroeconomics that uh, Pierre Richard straddles. Uh, he specializes in development macroeconomics, monetary policy, international finance, labor economics, <coughs> macroeconomics of poverty reduction, and the list pretty much goes on. So, you know, it's a rare breed of macroeconomists who seems to effortlessly straddle all these different sub-disciplines. Um, he holds a PhD in Mathematical Economics and Econometrics from the University of Paris. Um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Now the floor is yours. You will present for about half an hour, I understand, then we'll open it up to questions and answers. And then uh, we can convene for some drinks afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Timo, for this uh, extensive presentation. Uh, yes, this is my first visit here, but no regret, uh, wonderful uh, weather compared to where I was. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, public capital, but essentially uh, public capital means core infrastructure uh, here. Uh, economists like you to use the term public capital, and in general public capital could refer of course to uh, assets such as hospitals, schools, etc., but we're going to use a more narrow definition of uh, public capital, essential infrastructure, core infrastructure, uh, energy, telecommunications, transportation, and water and sanitation. And uh, as Timo said, uh, the book is uh, sort of an overview of my research over the past few years, but it's more than that. It's taking uh, a series of uh, uh, topics that have been addressed in the literature before, uh, many of them, and uh, try to provide a common thread, essentially an analytical framework uh, 
that can be adapted to answer various questions. So the first chapter of the book starts with a uh, workhorse uh, model, if you want. And uh, the model is adapted in subsequent chapters to address uh, different issues, as we will see, gender, innovation, etc. So uh, what I'm going to do is not so much talk about uh, the analytical framework itself. I don't want to get into any technical details. I don't think it's necessary, actually. Uh, I'm going to essentially give you an idea of the different channels that are discussed in the book and what are the policy implications. A broad policy implications, of course, given that this is not designed for a specific country, but I think that there are general lessons that can be drawn from this, uh, this line of work. And I still have to write down one equation, though, because it's quite important. And uh, this is the equation that economists typically use to define a public capital stock. So if we denote K as the capital stock, T plus 1 is time. So what this is saying is that the stock of capital at period T plus 1, I think I scared somebody already with that equation, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, you, uh, the stock of capital at period T plus 1 is equal to the stock of capital in the previous period, that's KT, multiplied by 1 minus a coefficient that we call delta. Delta is simply the depreciation rate. And plus I, which is investment I at period, uh, period T. So the capital stock at T plus 1 is the capital stock that you had at period T, adjusted for depreciation, plus the flow of investment. So this is the standard formula that uh, that we use. Well, to better think about what uh, the, the difference between stock and flows, imagine that you multiply the coefficient here of the flow uh, investment, the variable IT, by a coefficient that we call alpha, and alpha is between 0 and 1. And it's convenient to think of alpha as a measure of efficiency of investment or the quality of governance in general. What it means essentially, when alpha is less than one, it means that only a fraction of investment actually turns into capital. To give you a preview, empirical estimates of alpha range in a recent study conducted by the IMF and the World Bank between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6. If you take uh, uh, an average value of that, it means that typically more than 50% of investment actually is, does not turn into capital whether it's waste, whether it's corruption, whatever it is, it's just uh, a common fact and it does not depend on the level of income. You don't necessarily see a uh, smaller number uh, or high number rather in, uh, in richer countries. So that's the only equation that you're going to see and it's very helpful because it allows us to make a distinction between flows and stocks if, even if you invest a lot if alpha is very small, the capital that you are creating as a result is going to be relatively uh, small. So that's the sense in which what matters in this analysis is not the, the flow of investment itself, it's the stock and more precisely it's the flow of services that you can derive from the stock of public uh, capital. That's it in terms of equations. So let me first uh, address the issue of what economists typically think about when you ask uh, a question, what does public capital do for, uh, for growth? And typically the answer is something like this. The first point is that there is a distinction between flows and stocks. That's what we just saw. That's the efficiency factor that you, you saw earlier. The main effect as Timo was saying earlier, when we think about infrastructure, is the impact on productivity and production costs. Okay, if roads are in bad shape, typically it's going to cost you more to uh, operate trucks, to move goods around the country. Uh, typically, public capital being available in greater supply would mean that it has a positive effect on the productivity of private inputs, whether it's labor or capital. So that's the conventional view of looking at public capital. Second effect is a so-called complementarity effect. And it is the idea that if you are in an environment where public infrastructure is relatively good, 
you tend to have higher rates of private investment. Poor countries typically have where public capital stocks are relatively low, uh, have enormous problems in raising private rates of investment because you cannot really operate uh, firms in an environment where you don't have access to core infrastructure services. So the complementarity effect is actually quite important. It means that when you invest in infrastructure, it may have actually a benefit in terms of leading to higher private investment as well. Now, both effects are positive. The third effect that uh, economists would typically talk about is a so-called crowding out effect. It's essentially the idea that if, in order to invest, you have to raise taxes or you have to borrow from uh, uh, banks or you have to issue debt in order to finance uh, that uh, increase in uh, public capital, typically what you are going to see is that it's going to be more costly for the private sector to, uh, to invest. So if you think of a given amount of resources available for uh, investment, if the government uses more of it to invest in infrastructure, there will be less resources available for the private sector or it's going to cost the private sector more in order to, uh, to borrow. So in a sense, if the crowding out effect is very strong, it could even counteract the productivity and complementarity effects that you see, uh, you, that you see here. These are the typical effects that are well known if you want for economists. And, and the first chapter of the book actually goes through the evidence uh, for all three and shows how all three effects can be accounted for in uh, the model. But most of the book actually is not about those conventional effects. It is about what I call here the new channels. And uh, it's important, one thing that the, I, I do is actually take a lot of uh, the literature that is available in professional, journal, uh, in professional journals, scattered in professional journals, and essentially bring it together in a coherent uh, uh, manner. And there are also a uh, number of publications in, uh, uh, by international organizations, especially the, the World Bank and, uh, and the UN. Now the point is, it's not that all these channels were suddenly discovered. In fact, many of the channels that I'm going to talk about have been well documented for years. And if you think about two of the important channels that I'm going, uh, I'm going to describe, uh, health and education, if you talk to experts in health and education, they've been aware of the infrastructure aspect of their work for a long time. But the problem is that at the macro level, there has been very little work on integrating those things into the type of macro models that economists uh, uh, use. So when you, you talk to health or ed, uh, education experts, they are very well aware of these things, but people working on infrastructure and macroeconomists, whose job it is to think about how to allocate resources at the national uh, level, actually not taking all those uh, aspects into, uh, into account. And I must say, myself, when I started to think about these uh, issues, and I started to look at them because I was working on poverty issues, and when I started to look at education and health and the role of public capital, I must say that it was very difficult for me to actually get into that literature because it's a completely separate literature and macroeconomists typically would not go into that, that sort of uh, uh, professional journals and the publications that, where these issues uh, were raised. So uh, one aspect of the book is actually service to both uh, microeconomists and macroeconomists by trying to reconcile this, uh, uh, these two strengths of, uh, of the literature. So let's see what these channels are. Well, the first is, well, again, we already talked about it, the efficiency. Efficiency in the more recent literature has been related to more uh, explicitly to uh, corruption, uh, poor governance uh, in general. There are now very explicit models that allow us to understand better the determinants of, uh, of uh, efficiency and how to actually improve, improve efficiency. But the more important uh, uh, ones in terms of new channels, if you want, is uh, a rediscovery, in a way, of the importance of maintenance. 
not so much for the maintaining the quality of public assets per se, but the recognition that poor quality of public assets means actually extra costs for the private sector as well. And there are calculations showing that for every dollar that is not spent in maintenance of public assets, uh, it does have a significant cost in terms of depreciation of private sector uh, assets. Uh, there are studies for developing countries, quite a few, and there are also studies for the US where they can calculate how much it costs an individual, on average, for maintenance of a car as a result of poor roads. Okay? But more importantly for our purpose here is the discovery that public capital matters a lot actually when it comes to the production of education services and the production of health services. And in fact, it's not only the production but also the delivery of these services. And if you take some uh, basic uh, examples, if you want, what uh, electricity is essential for both schools and hospitals to, uh, to work to operate. You can, if you have vaccines, they need to be refrigerated. If you don't have electricity, then this is hard uh, uh, to do. Roads are very important because in many countries, many developing countries, access to medical facilities is hampered by the fact that people have to walk several miles to, uh, to get access to, uh, to a medical facility. And there are, of course, as you may know, uh, sad stories of uh, mothers dying on the side of the road because they don't have the time to reach a medical facility in order to uh, deliver their, uh, their babies. And uh, uh, roads are also important not only to get to those facilities but also to attract medical workers and uh, teachers, in particularly in rural areas. Without uh, access to uh, Roads, many, it's difficult to attract uh, qualified uh, doctors into rural areas because people are simply not willing to live permanently in those, uh, in those areas. And water and sanitation, very important in uh, schools. There are studies uh, showing that in countries where schools have access to sanitation, enrollment <coughs> rates for girls have increased very significantly. Okay? So the book actually goes through a series of examples uh, of that sort, and uh, of course, in terms of water and sanitation, uh, I should uh, add that there are very there's a wide range of studies showing the impact of uh, access to clean water on uh, malnutrition and infant mortality. So all these things are well documented, but when you put them at the macro level, the key concept then becomes the concept of effective labor. Okay. Effective labor is the uh, view that what matters for production is not only raw labor, the, the, the amount of time basically that you spend into production, it's going to depend on the quality of education and on the quality of the labor force, essentially the health status of workers. So effective labor is a concept that in a, in a sense summarizes all those uh, three uh, aspects. And clearly, uh, public capital is going to matter to the extent that it affects uh, effective labor through the production of education and health uh, services. And eventually, it's going to matter to, uh, for market uh, production. There are other aspects as well, uh, and directly related to the production of health services, is the fact that the production uh, helps you people tend to think more about the longer run uh, prospects, in principle. So it does affect the rate of time uh, preference, whether or not you want to, uh, you're going to save, whether or not you want to invest in higher education. If your horizon, time horizon, tends to increase, then that tends to affect your decisions to save and consume. And those decisions to save and consume, of course, are going to affect your propensity to invest in physical and human uh, capital. If life expectancy, the typical response when life expectancy increases, is for people to save more, either through personal 
a concept is your private uh, pension uh, system, but typically people would tend to save, uh, to save more. And as a result, more savings in the economy to the extent that it translates into high investment is going to affect private uh, capital and therefore market production, but also the decision to invest in human capital, which in turn, of course, is going to affect the production of education services. So these are really some of the key channels that uh, matter. There are a couple more, actually. One is so-called uh, network effect. Network effect is not an independent effect. It's really a size uh, effect. And to give you a simple view of what a network effect is, think of uh, the stock of public capital here as uh, the number of road segments. And vert on the vertical axis here, you have the what I call the efficiency of public capital. And if you're building, you're starting to build a network of roads. If you're building roads between, say, points A and B and points C and D, that's good for trade and business between those separate entities. But the moment you link B and C, you create the opportunity for trade between A and C and B and D and A and D. So, in other words, by adding one segment to the network, you've actually multiplied considerably the opportunities to trade and, uh, and exchanges between those different, uh, uh, different points. So one way of capturing that is to simply assume that up to a certain point, when you are building infrastructure, up to a certain point, you have some efficiency gains. But those efficiency gains are constant. Okay? Beyond a certain point, here between points A and B, you see that the curve is increasing pretty fast. That's the idea that you've reached a stage where adding the marginal gain from adding one more connection to the network is going to expand considerably interactions and therefore increase productivity of the existing capital. Okay? And beyond a certain point, uh, typically what you would have is that beyond point, uh, point B, if you continue to add roads, basically it's going to make a difference, but not, not as much. Very good example for industrial countries is the completion of the highway system in the US, where it's well documented that this led to a very significant increase in interstate uh, uh, trade. But beyond that, if you are adding more, the, the additions of additional roads, if you want, or highways, did not have the same marginal benefit. It's still positive, but not as strong. So that's one way of interpreting uh, network effects, and they tend to be quite, uh, quite significant. In, uh, uh, if you're in a poor country, starting with basically no roads, it doesn't, you don't gain much by adding a single road. What you're going you're to you're gain a lot by connecting <coughs> some important uh, points, and that's a consideration when you're devising a uh, program of investment in uh, transportation. Uh, a few other aspects, if you want, of infrastructure that I did not capture in that graph, what is an impact on innovation? And that's quite significant because uh, this refers to both the ability to innovate and the diffusion of innovation. And the key issue is really uh, to what extent public capital matters when you are uh, developing a growth strategy based on imitation. Essentially, for a developing country, uh, you're importing uh, blueprints uh, from the rest of the world, and you're, produ you're simply replicating those. So in a, in a way, what you're doing is imitation, which is a process through which many uh, currently middle-income countries have gone through already. Okay? But imitation can take you only so far. At some point, there's a, a the critical issue is to go from imitation to what you may call true innovation. The difference is, of course, that true innovation is more demanding in terms of skills, and also how it turns out in terms of uh, infrastructure. And the key issue uh, here is access to broadband. And there are studies showing that uh, broadband begins to make a big difference in terms of growth when it reaches 8 10% penetration rate. Okay? So in that sense, why is broadband so important? Broadband is important because it allows fast access to, uh, to information and the diffusion of, of ideas. 
And uh, again, there are several studies uh, looking at those, uh, uh, at those issues. The key point here is that the type of infrastructure that you need to be successful in a, with an imitation strategy is not the same type of infrastructure that you need to be successful in a true, for true innovation. This is actually one of the conclusions of a recent uh, report on innovation by the OECD, among other, among other institutions. Now, there's also an impact of infrastructure on income distribution. And uh, there, is, uh, there are a couple of studies showing that improved access to infrastructure may actually reduce inequality. Well, several reasons. One of them is that improved access uh, benefits the poor more than the rich. And you can, if you think of access to uh, clean water, for instance, you might say that the marginal benefit for the poor can be considerably higher than uh, it is for, uh, for people who already have uh, basic access. So if inequality is bad for growth, then you might say that if you're reducing inequality, inequality, infrastructure can contribute positively to growth through that uh, channel. Uh, my own take is that when you look at that part of the literature, it's not as strong as <coughs> some of the rest because causality could be could go uh, both ways. It could be that uh, improved access to clean water uh, gets you to be healthier, and that by being in better health, you actually work more, and therefore your productivity and wages improve. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that people who work more have higher wages, are able to buy uh, or to uh, avail themselves of uh, cleaner sources of access to water. So the causality is not quite clearly established. Uh, it's my own uh, judgment on that uh, on that point. But it, you have to keep in mind that there is a correlation between uh, the two. Another important source of impact, if you want, is uh, of infrastructure is the impact on women's time allocation. Now, I like, when I mentioned this, I like to say that it's really an important issue for developing countries, but usually the audience says, well, it's very important for industrial countries as well, if you think of Germany in particular. Uh, and the idea is uh, women in developing countries can spend up to two hours or three hours a day collecting wood and, uh, uh, and water. And those constraints, those activities impose significant constraints on their, uh, on their time. And what improved access to infrastructure would do, of course, is to reallocate time to other uh, activities. So let's take a more detailed view of this point, because I think it is quite, quite important. Let's think of women allocating their time to three activities. To home production, and home production is what I just said. Getting water, uh, cooking, etc. All activities related to, uh, to the home. There's also time that they allocate to their own health, and time allocated to uh, child, uh, child rearing. So in that sense, time allocated to market activity is the residual. Given the total amount of time, you can calculate as a residual the time allocated to market production. I'm excluding leisure here. I assume that's not an option for many women. Time allocated to market uh, production is the residual. And clearly, time allocated to market production has a benefit in terms of market activity. But time allocated uh, to own health obviously affect women's health and their productivity and eventually market production as well. Time allocated to child rearing also has an impact on children's health and education. So think of child rearing essentially as taking not only uh, cooking for children, but rather, which is uh, in the first category, but rather taking uh, children to medical facilities, etc. So that link is essentially creates an intergenerational link between mothers and children. And 
Mo uh, that's the link rather between mother's health and uh, children. And you also have an intergenerational link, which means that if children are healthy or uh, in better health in childhood, eventually they will become they will be more productive when they become adult. And that also has a benefit in terms of market activity. So this is important because when you think about women's time, uh, very often in, in economic models, the time allocated to home production and time allocated to child rearing is usually viewed as non-productive. Well, clearly, that is not, if you think about child rearing, if it helps to improve a, ch a child's health and education, this would have significant effect in terms of market production. And the implication is quite important. When you look at the impact on growth of changes in access to infrastructure, operating through this channel, it does not really matter that at the end of the day, women end up increasing the time spent in market production. It could be that there is an indirect effect Going through, the, uh, going through reallocation of time toward uh, children. There's another uh, feedback effect that is quite significant. Out of market production, women generate wage income, like men, and within now family resources, what we can see is changes in intra-household bargaining. There are studies showing that in households where women have high levels of education, their bargaining power in terms of allocating resources tend to be larger. Okay? And I'm just stating a fact. I'm not <laughs> totally convinced. But that's, uh, there are studies showing that this is indeed a possible challenge. So what may happen indeed is that as women's uh, time is reallocated to their own health, productivity improving, market activity generating higher income, you're going to see a reallocation of resources toward typically items that matter more for women, which is, again, based on documented studies, they, women tend to be more concerned about the health and education of their children. I'm talking about developing, developing countries. Okay? Uh, so that's another possible channel through which, at the end of the day, infrastructure can, uh, can matter. So providing better access to infrastructure means that, means that time allocated to home production is going to fall. Then the issue is how women reallocate their time. Whether they reallocate it to their own health or to child rearing, you can have benefits at the end of the day for market, uh, in terms of market production and growth. Now, this is a critical agenda, uh, in, in fact. Uh, uh, right now, the World Bank, they have asked all their, all their economists, any report, any country report, has to have some discussion of the gender dimension of uh, their, their economic programs, if you want. And uh, you can actually take all this and turn it into an actual model that you can use in order to do this kind of analysis. So the argument that, well, gender is not uh, important when it comes to growth, or gender cannot really be put into the type of economic models that macroeconomists uh, like to use, is not, is not true. This can be done, and you can do it in a way that captures uh, some, of these, uh, some of these elements. And, and you can make, of course, this graph a lot more complicated than it looks right now. So all I've said, as if it wasn't already complicated, but uh, all I've said so far is really good things about infrastructure. And uh, obviously there are all other uh, potential uh, negative effects of what we call here negative externalities, which are of course related to environmental damage and, uh, and pollution. And those could create negative effects on growth when, uh, in terms of uh, environmental degradation, that would be a direct loss of physical assets to be involved. And that would certainly have an impact on uh, production. But the effect could be also uh, indirect when you think about the impact of pollution on, uh, on uh, health and productivity. If you think about the diagram that, we showed, uh, that I showed earlier, uh, if life expectancy is adversely affected, 
this could have a negative effect on savings and this could translate into an adverse effect on growth. Now, does, does that imply that you have to uh, completely disregard the view of all those all the externalities that we, uh, we discussed? No. What it means simply is that when it comes to uh, thinking about infrastructure, you have to, in a sense, account or internalize those negative, uh, those negative effects. So if there, are, if there is a risk of uh, pollution or the risk of environmental damage, this has to be accounted for in the sense that the allocation of resources has to be uh, to take those negative effects uh, into, into account. Now, it may well lead to even to a conclusion that uh, the cost in terms of environmental damage or pollution may be so high that the investment is not, is not uh, worth it. But the reality for many developing countries is that growth is such an overwhelming <coughs> objective, environmental damage and environmental pollution, unfortunately, are not uh, always given the uh, consideration that, uh, that they deserve when uh, discussing uh, large infrastructure projects. So to summarize, if you want, but in the form of a few policy uh, implications. The first is, I think it uh, was clear from the beginning, the flow of investment is not a very good proxy for the accumulation of public productive assets. Remember the alpha that we talked about uh, earlier, it can be very significantly less uh, than one. For some countries, it's only three. Uh, so, even if you have a, uh, if you think about the stock, the stock can have uh, benefits. You can have the flow having a negative effect, a crowding out effect. And this distinction between stock and flows is extremely important when you think about the sustainability of public debt. Uh, that's a topic that I'm going to address uh, tomorrow or in a seminar. But the idea is simply that when you invest and you, you're issuing debt to finance uh, the investment. The debt obviously has to be repaid with interest. And, well, depends on which debt <laughs> you're talking about. But in principle, the debt has to be repaid. And what it means essentially that you have a, uh, the, by uh, issuing the debt, you're in a way diverting savings from private capital formation. Okay? to the benefit of the government. So on the one hand, you have a positive effect of the public uh, investment for all the reasons that we discussed earlier. But on the other, you may have a negative effect coming from the fact that the government using more of the existing pool of savings, it means that the private sector has less of it. So the issue is for, in order to have a sustainable public debt, the benefit that you get from the debt has to be in a sense, large enough to compensate for the fact that you're going to get lower private capital accumulation. The second is that, uh, I did not quite address that here, but it's important to account for the quality when it comes to uh, stocks of infrastructure, whether you're doing, you're looking at those, uh, the benefits in general. If you, you're building roads, one thing that we've, I've seen in uh, developing countries, very often when you start building roads, the number of uh, users increases much faster than the ability to uh, expand, if you want, the road, the road network. So what you get is congestion problems. And those congestion problems are very significant simply because they reduce the benefit of having uh, the roles of the uh, infrastructure asset in the first uh, in the first place. These points, if you want both, is that suggest that when you think about scaling up public investment, increasing massive increase in public investment, an issue that has been at the forefront of the international debate on uh, development and how to promote growth in poor countries. Well, it's not, again, simply about spending more. It is about improving 
your ability to select, implement, and monitor in, uh, investment uh, uh, projects. So what you're really talking about here is to, you need to address not only the uh, issue of the level of spending, but also the institutional framework within which investment is going, uh, is, uh, high investment is going to take uh, place. Third point, which I think is clear uh, by now, is that beyond the productivity and cost effects that you typically hear when people talk about uh, infrastructure projects, whether it's a high-speed rail or a new road or any uh, of that sort, it's not only uh, about productivity and cost. You have a range of other potential benefits that you need to uh, consider. And uh, in many uh, countries, what you see is that very often when you build, uh, building a new road actually attracts a number of uh, activities. And beyond those activities, you have benefits in terms of uh, the things that I've talked about, in terms of health, in terms of education, which can be uh, equally significant. And Network externalities, it's important to account for them, as we said uh, uh, earlier. And when you talk about then uh, an investment program, well, if you're going to build a, a high-speed rail system, in a way, it's a system, you can't limit yourself to just doing a small segment. You've got to think big in those things. So scale matters, essentially, when it comes to uh, infrastructure. If you want really to reap the benefits, of, uh, uh, of the investment. Fourth is actually more of a call to macroeconomists to really start introducing those uh, channels into, uh, into their, uh, their models. I'm quite amazed when I go uh, to some places and I look at what type of macroeconomic models that people continue to use when they try to introduce infrastructure, well, all the benefits or all the effects that are being uh, captured all those that we discussed earlier, impact on complementarity, on, on the crowding out effect, etc. It's all good, but what this is showing is that the human development aspects can be equally, if not more, more important. So there is a challenge here for macroeconomists to think uh, in broader terms, not only about the growth per se, but also uh, try to integrate uh, human development uh, indicators. I've been involved in some of this uh, work, and it's actually doable. You can link models with a range of human development indicators because some of these indicators are related to variables that you can capture in macro, uh, in macro models. And let's be uh, provocative and simply say that, well, when you think about the investment in infrastructure, it's, it's not even as, uh, as much about promoting markets than it is about uh, promoting health, education, and possibly uh, gender equality. And uh, I'm pretty convinced of, of that. And the usual, uh, the implication of that, brother, is that sometimes the best way to improve outcomes in education and health may actually be to invest in infrastructure. I think the example that I gave earlier of uh, improved access to sanitation in schools, especially in Muslim countries, tends to have a very big effect on uh, uh, girl enrollment rates in those schools. There are several studies that have documented that, uh, that fact. Okay? So there is here something to, uh, to think about when uh, you design uh, infrastructure programs. It's not simply about uh, production. Now, people who are experts in education and health usually jump and say, wait a minute, you want to cut my budget? No. <laughs> it's not, this is not to deny that you have serious, you may have serious problems in education and in developing countries there are serious problems in terms of access to uh, school materials, paying teachers, something I firmly believe in, you know, but at the same time uh, you can't uh, forget the fact that in some cases the constraint is not in uh, getting uh, and spending more on, uh, on, on uh, producing services, but it's the delivery of the services that matter. In order to get more qualified health workers 
to go into rural areas, well, you may need to provide better access to those areas, to put it uh, in concrete uh, uh, terms. And uh, finally, all this, what this is saying is that we have to rethink the way infrastructure projects are selected. The traditional way of looking at infrastructure projects is to think of IIRs, internal rates of return. Basically, you calculate how much it costs, what is the expected revenue, and you, you decide on that basis, more or less, whether the project should go forward. But typically, there's some political economy aspect to big infrastructure projects, but usually, the type of benefits that I've just mentioned in terms of health and education are very rarely taken into account when uh, these type of projects are discussed. And at least in developing countries where health is such an important constraint on growth and development, it would be a mistake not to think about those aspects which are now well documented at the micro level and hopefully uh, with this type of contributions, macroeconomists would be more willing to integrate those kind of, of reasoning in their uh, macro models. But it has to be also at the micro level, at the level of the selection of infrastructure projects. Now, how to do it in practice? What is the methodology? This is a different uh, story. I'm not necessarily in a good position to, uh, to do it. But there are uh, ways of, uh, I'm sure, by putting together education, health, and infrastructure specialists, there, there sh must be a way to develop a methodology to do these things more systematically. With the fact that we've never done it is no reason not to try. And I'll finish on, on that one. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Pierre Richard. Um, we will open it up now to some questions, if there are any. I know it's a small room, so we don't really need a microphone, but because okay. the session is being recorded, um, we would like to be able to record and properly capture the questions as well. Any takers? Uh, the narrow definition of, of public capital you're using, uh, you know, sort of basically economic infrastructure, uh, you then extend, if you like, through a lot of uh, externalities or um, complementarities or crowding out effects to other areas, particularly health and education. The narrative you gave essentially sees the direction of causation from the hard infrastructure to the soft infrastructure. It's possible easily to conceive of a lot of causation from soft infrastructure to hard infrastructure. So if I'm writing a book on education and health and the building of hospitals and universities and schools, I can see substantial implications for educated women, uh, educated folk, whatever, uh, wanting broadband, wanting roads so they can drive their cars uh, as they get into the labour market because of their education. I'm wondering if what we need, uh, dare I say, is a general equilibrium model of public capital broadly defined rather than, which is not to say we don't need all the insights you've got, but maybe you know, the next part, that's the platform for the, uh, the meta model, if not all the way to a macro model. I'm just what you think of the, the two-way causations here and whether, no doubt, in the empirical work that may be in the book, there is some capacity to have reflected that. Right. Well, I think you're, 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 you're right. Uh, the, uh, the focus here is on core infrastructure, but building schools and building hospitals is obviously an essential part. Uh, if you think in terms of schools, but what really uh, strikes me uh, here is that I remember going to this country, Niger, where the government, uh, the president decided he's going to build, I don't know, hundreds of schools. So they start building the schools, and then they say, wait a minute, you know, that's relatively low cost to build a school. But how do you bring electricity? How do you create, uh, uh, give access to water and sanitation to those schools? So there's an issue of uh, scale that makes a big difference, I think, when it comes to building uh, individual schools and 
when you talk about giving access to water and sanitation. The scale of the problem is quite different. You can build those schools, but to have uh, to reap the benefits, if you want, of that, you're going to need that uh, uh, to provide access to infrastructure. So that's the focus, if you want, of this uh, of this book. But uh, clearly, you could, when you talk about allocation of public spending, you could think of several types of public capital where you have not only core infrastructure, which could be, as I just said, specified in such a way that it plays a con the role of a constraining factor on the other types of capital, right? You need, in order to produce a capital stock that can be used in education, you need to combine core infrastructure and public capital in education. The school, the, bu the school buildings, and the core infrastructure, right? You can do that, and then discuss the allocation of resources among those different levels. Now, you said something else, which is also that uh, it goes both ways. So you could build the public capital that is complementary to the existing capital in education and health, the schools, etc. But the very fact that you provide that is going to create a demand, perhaps, for a different type of infrastructure, right? That's, that's absolutely uh, correct. And the only question is that how does uh, this uh, change in demand translate into actual changes in policies? Okay. So now you need, in a way, you need to go beyond what this book does and provide a, a framework in which you can think of the allocation of public expenditure being decided not to maximize growth, not uh, to maximize necessarily outcomes in education and health per se, but how the political system, in a way, uh, translates those demands for public, uh, public goods, right? into actual decisions. And that's another, that's another issue. Uh, and the issue is, uh, in the political economy uh, sense, if you want, how much power those uh, who want this type of uh, services are going to be able to affect the decisions of, uh, of the government. Uh, and that's not something that I discuss here, but certainly matters uh, can, can be addressed in another book. Hi, <laughs> the Australia infrastructure reform usually requires agreement of a number of governments. And one of the techniques that we use to break deadlock is to ask a body like the Productivity Commission to work out the benefits of the proposed reform. Is the take home message from the seminar that we've been underestimating the benefits? Or is it the case that in countries like Australia, the health and education <coughs> effects are pretty marginal? Well, I don't know enough about Australia to say, uh, to make any statement of uh, that would be strong. I can give you just two reactions uh, to that. One is the fact that usually when people think about, uh, you, you ask for an analysis of impact, usually people take a static view. The static view is to say, well, uh, this is the environment, right? And this is what we believe is going to happen if you make the investment given the environment. Well, the thing is, the infrastructure itself is going to change the environment. And I think that's the important point. When you create a, uh, in Brazil, for instance, they are building a high-speed rail between Sao Paulo and Rio, okay? But it's not only about how, what this is going to do for improving traffic uh, exchanges between Sao Paulo and Rio. It's going to have an effect on all the cities in between the two, the, those two big cities. And with the proper design, if you think about, and that's what they are doing, they are creating feeder services, essentially access to that high-speed rail from different cities along that, that road. What will happen is that you're going to bring now more of those uh, uh, cities or, or, or areas, if you want, into the picture. So you have to think in a dynamic sense, not in a static sense. It's not, you have to think to anticipate in a way how this is going to affect uh, behavior. Well, it could be that given the cost of, of uh, uh, living in Rio, I may decide to go and work 60 miles from Rio, for instance, right? 
well, that is going to change the labor market and the property, property prices. Uh, there. What are the repercussions? Firms may find it easier to move away from congested uh, city areas into areas that have more, uh, where they are going to have to create more infrastructure themselves. So all those are what you may call dynamic effects that you know they may have accounted for them. You have to, in a sense, anticipate and guess to some extent what those uh, those effects are. But I can tell you for a fact that there's a series of studies by the European Union. There's a report that just came out by the uh, Lincoln Institute in the U.S. where they looked at the impact of uh, high-speed rail in Europe, particularly France and Germany, where they looked at the impact that the high-speed rail uh, system had on uh, on those uh, on the cities that were linked through the the new uh, the new uh, rail lines. Okay, and. The benefits are quite significant. They are more than, in a sense, were expected at, uh, at the beginning, simply because it creates a, some sort of a dynamic process, and it leads to changes in the way people work, in the way people live, and the way people, uh, firms, uh, set uh, their, their locations. OK? It's not necessarily all good. You know, there's a study on India, in India, for instance, where they argued uh, when they built a major highway, what happened is that it contributed to the spread of AIDS because it attracted a lot of uh, uh, prostitutes, if you want, along the, along the highway. So it's not necessarily all that, that positive. So that's the first, uh, uh, the first point that I wanted to, uh, to make. And the second is uh, to think in terms of uh, network effects that perhaps if you're thinking about doing it for one particular area, maybe you would be getting benefits that are more important if you were to consider linking a group of cities as opposed to linking only, uh, only two of them. And that again requires making judgment as to what this uh, externality would be. And maybe you know, it's not in the nature of, uh, I don't know, technicians to, be, to think in those terms, I don't know. Because if you're being asked to do uh, a, taxi, a, a particular task, maybe you're not gonna, you know what, I think that tomorrow we're gonna get 20 new firms sitting in that particular uh, area. You may not be able to make that kind of judgment simply because you don't have a strong basis. But the fact is when you look at empirical studies, and you may, you may look at, at, at uh, the ones that I've uh, talked about earlier, there are significant benefits, they go well beyond what was anticipated initially. Okay? Any other questions? May I just add one quick one? Use my power as Chief please. Chair. <laughs> to me, a lot of it does come down to implementation, which you brushed aside a little bit. I think most people would accept that there are network effects to infrastructure, for example, but it's devilishly difficult to put a number on these network effects. And because it's so difficult, that's why infrastructure projects easily become a political football. You have one side saying the network effects are going to be very large, and the other side doesn't think so, and who's to say who's right because it's so difficult to put a number on it anyway. So do you think we'll eventually be able to arrive at a methodology where we can proof this, the methodology such that it doesn't become a political football? We can't put a reasonably accurate number on it? That to me still seems to be the, the million dollar question. Well, there's always a political economy aspect to infrastructure, whether it's in the selection of projects, the implementation, the location, of infrastructure projects. So I'm not sure that you're ever going to get a situation where you can take out all the, the politics out entirely of those things. I'm not too sure about that. But in terms of the precise point of estimating what are the gains, the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. And I think it's quite, uh, quite important. And it really has to come from what is the question that you're asking. If you're asking infrastructure specialists, 
you just go about their business and calculate internal rates of return and tell me, well, that's your best guess of the, of the flow, that's your best guess of the flow of income, uh, they're going to limit themselves to their own uh, task. Uh, what you need to do is to force those guys to work systematically with people in education and in health and people who are interested in gender so that they can force them to think about those issues and uh, as usual there has to be a clear message from the top in order to get this, this, uh, uh, these things done. And interestingly enough, I gave a presentation, I think I told you a month ago in India, at the request of the World Bank, where they were discussing all of those uh, very important issues, of course, for India. And even at the level of the World Bank now, they've decided they're going to do a pilot project where they're going to put together experts in all those different areas to sit down together and think about all those aspects of infrastructure systematically. And that's the way to go. I'm not saying that you're going to get a perfect methodology. But if you had ask an education expert, they can calculate what is going to be the impact in their view on the on number of graduates, the impact that this is going to have on health outcomes. And health experts know those things. The question is to get these guys to work together. That, I think, is the problem. And the truth is, because macroeconomists typically have not paid any attention to these issues, uh, infrastructure specialists have been doing their work, but they haven't been asked necessarily to think about those other aspects. No wonder that there is no methodology that has been uh, uh, developed. But if this serves any purpose, is to say that, well, you know what, you should, uh, you should do it. Now, let me add that the impact on education and health are clearly very, very important for developing countries. It's not clear that this is going to matter a lot for industrial uh, countries. It could well be that the other aspects are more important. Right? But that's a judgment that you have to make. Whether improved access to better health facilities is going to make that big of a difference in a country like uh, Australia or the US is not, is not clear. But there are other aspects, gender, etc., that could be uh, uh, equally, uh, equally important.